Welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for August 24, 2022. I am Latricia Vita, and I am the chair of this committee. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council Member Wansley. Present. Rainville. Present. Ellison. Here. Palmasano. Present. Vice Chair Payne, absent. Chair Vita. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. Um, I know that there are a number of members, uh, a number of community members here today to discuss item one. So I will uh, take up the proposed consent agenda first. Thereafter, there, um, there are five items on today's consent agenda. Uh, item one is confirming an appointment to the Public Health Advisory Committee. Item three is authorizing a joint powers agreement with the state of Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for air monitoring services. Item four is accepting an additional grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for the Safer Sex Intervention Project. Item five is accepting a grant from the National Association of County and City Officials for Emergency Preparedness for Homelessness Hygiene. Item six is amending a resolution from the National Association of County and City Officials for Overdose and Suicide Prevention. Is there any discussion on these items? Seeing none, I will move for approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. Our next item is a public hearing on the police department's proposed use of unmanned aerial vehicles. Commander John Kingsbury from the police department is here to present on this item. Thank you, Commander Kingsbury. Sorry, Chair Vita here. Just a couple technical difficulties. And I don't know why it opened before. Oh, that out. I wonder if do you see just on yeah, go to this one. This one? Yep. This one. Yep. It showed up before. Should I change? I mean, yeah. That's the top one before. It shouldn't matter. There we go. Oops. So. Thank you. Yes. All right, Chair Vita, Vice Chair Payne, Council Members, I'm John Kingsbury. I apologize for the technical difficulties. I did stop in here early and test it out, and I still had problems. So thank you for getting me on the, on the way here. I'm here with uh, Deputy Chief Kathy Waite and Officer Paul Dewu, and we are part of the MPD team that is organizing and planning the unmanned aerial vehicle program for the MPD. We put together a short presentation today just to answer some initial questions or basic questions that you might have, and then set the context for any further details you might have later on in the discussion. Some of the things that I want to discuss today, what we propose on using UAVs for, as well as what this program is not, which is very important, and then the oversight that is in place for this program. Our program objective is simple. We want to utilize technology to enhance our emergency response to the public safety needs of the city. Law enforcement agencies across the state and across the country have utilized this technology to great benefit for the last several years. Most programs are expanding or uh, departments that don't have programs are implementing them right now. These five items up there are just part of the list where UAVs could have an impact. Crime scenes and accident reconstruction, they're critical to get documented quick, efficiently, and with a high level of detail. Special events, Minneapolis still draws local and national events to the city 
using UAV technology to plan our security plans, uh, identify vulnerabilities, and in the event that there is an incident, to plan our response and organize that to that emergency situation. UAVs provide us that technology. Search and rescue. We can cover a lot of area quickly to search for a lost child, a vulnerable adult, or even a suspect, much more so than officers on foot or in squad cars. Documentation, that's critical, especially in natural disasters, whether it's for future reference or in the event that it's ongoing. UAVs provide us the ability to get the size and the scope of these incidents to plan our response. And like I said, for future documentation, which is generally relevant to financial considerations and things like that with the federal government. Importantly, too, is responding to active emergencies. We see UAVs as providing us the opportunity to get the most information possible to decision makers in a real-time manner. Having that information is important for the leaders of the police department and the city to have to make the correct decisions. There are often blind spots in these situations. We cannot always put an officer into a certain location because it's too dangerous to gather the information we need to make the right decisions. And sometimes we can't put an officer into a location because it's physically impossible, whether it's a tall building or terrain underneath a bridge, for example. Using this technology will mitigate these blind spots and give us the information we need for those decision makers. What this program is not, it is not a surveillance program. Please understand that despite what we see on TV, or in the movies, or even on the news. That's not what this is. As I stated before, this program is set to respond to emergencies and public safety needs. There's no random surveillance involved with this. Any surveillance is subject to state statute and a search warrant. There's also no active surveillance that will be utilized with this technology. And by active surveillance, I mean drones up in the sky 24 hours a day, seven days a week, watching everybody. That's not what this is. These are commercially available drones they're not military grade, they're not predator drones, they're things that any of us in this room can go by on our own. The technology has advanced that far. But again, not military, this is not a surveillance program. Something that might put that into perspective a little bit is that in 2021, there were only four uses out of over 2,200 of UAVs by law enforcement agencies in Minnesota that involved surveillance aspects. And in 2020, there were none. So I think that emphasizes the point that law enforcement has found multiple needs beyond surveillance for this technology. Levels of oversight. There are three that really have impacted us to this point right now in organizing and planning our program. The FAA, our proposed department policy, and then state statute. The FAA, real briefly, governs all civil airspace in the United States. They set the traffic rules for the sky, so to speak. Everything from what we need to train our pilots to get their certifications, to the size and type of UAVs that we can purchase. Also, they do have an enforcement aspect, that being usually civil fines or penalties, such as license revocation or suspension. So there is some enforcement there, and they, again, are the ones that set the rules for how, when, and where we fly these UAVs. MPD policy. This is a proposed policy. What we have posted online is, was developed by looking at current policies that other departments have across the state, taking into consideration state law, constitutional law, as well as input from organizations that have put out opinions such as the ACLU. This is ongoing. This is part of the process for us to finalize the policy. And again, it is not finalized yet. We will take all what is said into consideration evaluate it, and incorporate it into the policy if it's appropriate. Not only public comment here, but outside organizations have volunteered their opinions. In fact, I believe the mayor and the commissioner have met with the ACLU to get their opinion on our current draft policy. A couple of things about our policy, though, that we should point out in its current draft form. One thing that we have added is quarterly reports to the chief of police, so she knows how and what the program is being used for. In addition to that, too, is the level of oversight as far as deployment. UAVs cannot be deployed unless the commander of special operations or a deputy chief or above authorizes it. So right now, that's currently only six people in the police department that can authorize its use. And I think that's critical to point out. It's not just any officer out on the street deciding to fly a drone. And with that, too, also is the documentation aspect. In our current policy, 
we require a police report for every drone deployment or every UAV deployment. And with that comes case numbers, names, badge numbers, everything that comes with a full police report. We don't necessarily require that for training or demonstrations. However, please note that documentation still occurs in those situations. Software that we are looking at to purchase that is used with these UAV platforms documents pretty much everything that you can think of. Weather situation, flight pattern, time of day, weather conditions, pilots, all that information is electronically gathered and stored with every UAV flight. And then Minnesota state statute. It's a pretty short statute, but it's very clear on what law enforcement can and cannot do when it comes to UAVs. Importantly to note that when surveillance or when UAVs will be used for, for surveillance, search warrants are required. And like I said before, that only occurred four times in 2021 and no times in 2020. Statute also specifies limitations on its use. For example, no biometric technology can be used with these UAVs. That's facial recognition or voice recognition. Also, there's no uh, arming of these UAVs, meaning less lethal or lethal weapons cannot be put on these. In addition to that, too, data, or data that is gathered, which for us would likely be mostly video, must be deleted with seven days unless it is part of an active criminal investigation. And it's important to note, too, that the statute specifies specific remedies. They, put into the statute basically an exclusionary rule, meaning that any data or information gathered with a UAV in violation of this statute cannot be used for any criminal, civil, or administrative proceeding. It's pretty clear cut. In closing, I just want you to understand that MPD realizes the apprehension of some of the citizens of Minneapolis as far as this technology. It is a great responsibility for us to use it out there, and we take that very seriously. Thank you for your time and I look forward to the feedback. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, do any of my colleagues have questions? Vice Chair Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just speak to the general requirements for receiving an, a warrant and what types of limitations a warrant would narrow your use of a drone for. So as far as narrowing the use, uh, like I said, our, our what we want to use these UAVs for is a response to public safety needs. And surveillance is a very low aspect of that or a very low use that we see for that. As far as the search warrant, the search warrant requirements are just like any other search warrant as far as showing probable cause. Basically, a fair probability of the evidence that is sought is going to be where we believe it's going to be. Uh, a couple limitations with this, these particular search warrants that are listed in the statute is that they are sealed, but after they're unsealed, at a maximum of 90 days, the subject of that search warrant must be notified that this happened. So any covert surveillance that happens and the subject of that that might not know what was going on will be notified no later than 90 days by the judge. And then I was curious, have we already budgeted the purchase of these drones or is this coming from, like, what source of funding is the purchase of these drones gonna come from? Yes, sir. My understanding is that it's coming from the police department budget and that it's already in there in the general fund. Any more questions? Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Vita. Um, I just had a quick question. Can you provide um, or go back to the slide where it, it kind of outlines, you know, the policy parameters? Because um, I think the, the biggest issue right now is the fear of compliance. Um, with the policy and just using the example that was raised in the MDHR, MDHR findings where, you know, we didn't even have an issue with drones. We had an issue of officers using um, Facebook outside of, you know, the identify parameters um, to still do surveillance um, on black and brown leaders and residents. So I think there's a, a heightened concern of we might have these policies in place, but there's not execution in following it. And that's already being documented in the MDHR findings. And also there's nothing, <laughs> we haven't allowed space for the consent decree process to happen so that we can actually 
have a legal binding document that enforces that, that compliance. So can you actually speak to how you see the consent decree process um, help, helping strengthen you all's compliance with some of these policies that you have in place related to all sorts of, I'm gonna frame this as surveillance. It might not be the, the intention in this usage, but that's how it ends up being utilized. So can you speak to that or if there's been considerations around how the consent decree process will help shape compliance with drone usage in the future? Yes, Council Member Wansley, if I understand you correctly, you would like to know how I see the consent decree. I, I see it and not knowing a whole lot about consent decrees because like you said, we're very early in the process. Uh, my understanding is that it would add another level of, I guess, auditing maybe would be a better way of putting it, an independent group looking at the UAV usage outside of department members. So I think that should add um, some, uh, a feeling of trust with them, and then if there is something there with the data they see, that they will call attention to it, and then through the consent decree or department policy, see that there are you know, accountability, see that there is accountability. And I don't know if this is also identified. I, I know we just had an update on our discipline matrix. Um, do we know if there's kind of what is the consequences of violating, you know, these these compliance measures that you have in place? Um, what what is the consequence if you do find someone that uh, an officer that has misused, you know, these drones as same with Facebook, kind of what are the consequences to be expected by MPD leadership or Mayor Fry, who has oversight authority over MPD? So as far as the consequences, because this is a draft policy, we have not defined what level of violation that pertains to each section of that policy, uh, what repercussions there might be. I will say this, though, as with most of our policy, the violations and the accountability that goes with that depends on the level. Meaning, for example, from our proposed policy, a police report was not written when it should have been written, even though the UAV, uh, the rest of the UAV policy was followed. That would very likely be a lesser offense, so to speak, than if a police report were not written and the UAV use was not authorized by one of the six people that I mentioned and state law was violated. I can see that as being a very, very substantial uh, penalty with that. Do you know if there's anything under works to like document some of the things that you're sharing of like what are the kind of the spectrum of those, you know, discipline measures um, based off the usage of this? Is there anything in the works right now? Not until we finalize policy, but as always, it's a consideration when we build the policy that once it's finalized, then we go through and look at it and analyze the level of violation, like I said, and what penalty would be attributed to each violation depending on the section. And just last question, timeline around like when this policy might be finalized? I, I couldn't tell you, but it's gonna be several weeks down the road because like I said, we wanna evaluate all the input that we're getting, mm -hmm. not only from the group that's here today, but what was submitted online, mm -hmm. as well as the groups that the mayor and the, and the commissioner have met with already. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Wansley. Council Member Pompasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Lieutenant Kingsbury, in my conversations with concerned parties about this kind of technology purchase, um, there's significant concern on the surveillance end, um, particularly in lawful assembly or concern around targeting based on characteristics, right? Um, some of which have race implications and we, don't, we want to make sure that we're being um, equitable in, in how we would use such a thing. But when I read through the policy, the visual observer requirement mm -hmm. really eliminates some of those concerns, um, I think. Um, but could you talk just a little bit more about the visual observer um, requirement in the use of a drone by MPD? Because I think it's important for people who are concerned about surveillance. Yes, thank you for the question. So as far as the visual observer, that is a requirement from the FAA that each UAV flight, every pilot that is controlling that air, aerial vehicle has a person with them watching the surroundings to make sure that there are no hazards that enter into the space that that UAV is flying in. So that's what that visual observer is, is meant to do. Now, to your point, um, that adds another person uh, and another level of accountability who are out on the scene when a UAV is being used and to 
watch each other and take care of each other to make sure that they stay within policy as well as within the law. Vice Chair Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I wanted to follow up. So it sounds, so, so one question I have is the state statute simply states we have to have a public hearing. It doesn't necessarily state what we have to do with that feedback. So I wanna know how we plan on incorporating today's feedback. I also wanna know how do we continue to incorporate feedback and adjust this policy as, you know, as Collins Member Wanzi is asking, you know, what, what should be the right thresholds for discipline if there is misuse, what should those different layers of discipline be in those scenarios? But then how do we also incorporate community feedback as we see it in the field and see what's working and not working? Are we gonna have a quarterly opportunity to get that feedback or how might we adjust this policy going forward? So as far as, far as policy adjustments going forward, uh, I see it as going as most policy adjustments in the sense that we are constantly evaluating and unless there's a specific incident that causes us to look at the policy, we just monitor what's going on with best practices across the nation, across the metropolitan area, law changes, case law changes, and adjust as we go. Now as far as public opinion, I think forums such as this, uh, as well as the MPD comment page itself are good avenues to uh, put those opinions forward. Uh, and as far as the quarterly report, the quarterly report right now, the way the draft policy is written would go to the chief of police. But as far as what you know is done with it after that, it's, it's a public record, just like the, the uh, report to the state each year. So that's something you would all have access to, I believe. Is that something that would be proactively published so that the public can consume, or would that be something that would need to be requested via data practices request? That I would actually defer to the chief on or the mayor on. Uh, that is probably not a decision I should be making. Council Member Ellison. I do want to make sure Council Member Rainville's not getting lost in the shuffle. I, I think I've seen his tag up, but I will, I'm happy to go. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I, uh, uh, so first, in, in terms of getting feedback, you know, uh, you mentioned that the final policy is several weeks out in terms of drafting. So in some ways, people here today are going to be responding to a policy that may not be finalized or that may be subject to significant change um, and partially maybe having to you know, testify on the very concept of drones in general. Do you all plan to come back to this forum, have more public hearings, um, and uh, as the policy solidifies? There is no plan at this point, but I think there are several mechanisms in place for public comment to continue to come in, those that currently exist within the police department as well as you all receiving that from your constituents. Uh, as far as the policy not being finalized and people responding to its current version, um, state law requires that that is posted. So once the policy is finalized, it will be posted and likely for us, we'll post it separately in a conspicuous place on the website, not just in our regular full department policy. So there will be access to it after. And like I said, the ongoing comments should continue through the normal mechanisms that people use. Well, thank you. And I do want to encourage that you all come back to this forum specifically. I think it is a good place for people to um, uh, be heard more directly uh, as opposed to just written word or submitting a comment. And so, you know, it's something that I'm happy to engage in and engage the chair in because that's it's the chair's discretion as well. Um, but I do think that it would be good to to come back to this forum um, a few more times as the policy gets solidified so that people can respond to whatever the final policy ends up looking like. Uh, the other question that I had was uh, around um, Kind of around ac accountability and checks and balances as well. I know that, you know, there are instances in everyday police work in which um, an officer might engage someone for one reason and end up charging that person with, for a different crime. Right? I'm thinking of the famous Terry v. Ohio case that sort of allowed for things like stop and frisk. Um, if the use of the drone uh, is for one thing and ends up capturing something else on the video, um, is you know. Is that are, are, can people be can people expect to kind of be uh, subject to an arrest based on things uh, that they when they maybe weren't the original um, uh, target or maybe whatever it was you were looking for you end up finding something else um, can people sort of in, anticipate that kind of thing um, with this drone program? I, I would see that as being a very rare circumstance. 
And that would be something to defer to the city attorney or the Hennepin County attorney because on how the, uh, how the evidence was obtained might be considered to violate the state statute and therefore it could not be used. Uh, the other aspect of that too is that unless whatever data we gather is part of a current investigation, it's gone after seven days, maximum of seven days, I should say. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, and I, I bring that up just because I know that, you know, often when it comes to things like stop and frisk and, and, and you know, the Terry v. Ohio case, often it was, you know, well, we're searching for guns, we didn't find any, but hey, this person had marijuana or this person had, and that kind of thing perpetuating this cycle of, you know, um, race and equity in our criminal justice system that I don't think we want to replicate with, you know, increases in technology. So that's why I bring that up. Um, but thank you for your answers and uh, I'll let you know if I have more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lieutenant, thank you for your very clear and concise presentation. And I, I would like to ask if all council members could get a copy of that PowerPoint sent to us. Yes. Thank you. And I do have a question. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what other departments, is, uh, are there are 70 agencies in this state that use this technology? About 76 we made a report to the BCA last year. Uh, I think it was 93 in 2020. I don't understand the reason for discrepancy in those numbers, but again, agencies are only required to report when they uh, use one of the exceptions under the statute and not a search warrant. So, um, so that's what I know. And as far as the metropolitan area, uh, currently New Brighton and I believe Maple Grove are going through the same process we are. Uh, Golden Valley, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, Anoka County Sheriff's Office, uh, Plymouth Police Department, Dakota County, I, the list could go on as far as the metropolitan area uh, agencies that already have these UAVs and are using them. Thank you. And could you just elaborate a little bit more about the, the typical use, uh, why it helps uh, the police department? The biggest help that I see is that emergency response or that ongoing response when a critical incident, and I don't mean critical incident in the one sense, I mean something uh, extreme. Uh, and getting that information in real time to the decision makers, the deputy chiefs, myself, the mayor even, for that matter, on how to respond. Because as we've seen over the years, the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. And what this does is it gives us access to information that we might not normally get without this technology, where it's too dangerous or we're unable to put an officer to get that information firsthand. Uh, would an example then be in, in, uh, in the ward I represent a lot of people fall or jump in the river, there's a lot of river rescue, uh, rescues, would that be uh, a That, that would definitely be a good example, council member. Um, it allows us to get access to places and see things that we normally couldn't do, and quickly as well. You know, getting a drone out there to fly over the river to start to search for somebody that needs help can happen much more quickly than the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office or the Fire Department get the boat on the river and start to look. Great. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Commander Kingsbury, for the presentation, and thank you for answering questions. I have a couple questions myself. Just quickly, um, have you purchased this equipment already? No. It, when, what's the timeline for purchasing the equipment? I would say at least a month to two months. We'd like to, we want to finalize policy first, and then we'll start to look into purchasing. Uh, oh, thank you. How many drones do you think you're going to purchase? What's the budget for? We haven't got that far as far as what the specific budget limitations are, but from what we've seen out there and, and the prices that exist, we're probably looking at about thirty to forty thousand dollars per drone. No, 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 ma'am. For oh, all the for drones. all the equipment. Yeah. Okay. They come in different shapes, sizes, costs, uh, everything from ones that are $700 up to thousands of dollars. Okay. Thank you. And then my last question: You said that you know, there's a command staff that can authorize the use, but how many staff will be trained on using? Like, who is that staff? What, what is the training gonna be like for folks who are using this equipment? Yes, yeah, so outside of the, the committee, which currently right now involves uh, two sergeants, a lieutenant, uh, an officer, myself, and then Deputy Chief Waite, um, not necessarily all of those people will be trained in this, but we are looking probably for a core of six to 10, and that's rough, a rough estimate right now, because what we'd like to do is get the program up and running uh, with officers that already have their pilot certification. Any 
people that are brought onto the team that need their pilot certification will go through the FAA training and get their 107, which is basically a license to fly the UAVs. And also we have the option of getting a certificate, a certificate of authority, which authorizes the city to self-certify its pilots. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for the presentation and the questions. Uh, right now, I'm gonna proceed to the public hearing. Um, I understand that we have probably well over 20 people signed up to speak at this point. If you did not sign up yet and you wish to speak, please go see the clerk and do so. I'll ask, when, you, when you're called up, I'll ask that you state your name for the record and keep your comments to two minutes, please. The timer by the clerk will show you how much time you have remaining. I'll go through the list of speakers as I've received them. Please forgive me in advance if I mess up your name. I'm going to try my best to get it right. If I don't know how to pronounce it, I'll just use a letter. That way it doesn't get too bad, right? <laughs> so thank you all so much for your patience. And the first person we have uh, signed up to speak is uh, Conrad Zabowski. And then uh, after Conrad is Joe Tamburino. So uh, Conrad, will you please step up and state your name for the record? Hello, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, my name is Conrad Zabowski. I live in Ward 3. Uh, Chair Vita and committee members, thank you for hosting this public meeting today. Um, I support remote reconnaissance uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, community safety agencies uh, are able to have eyes on a scene without deadly force, uh, and that's really important for some uh, instances where we want to uh, have that. Um, and then also it doesn't put officers or residents at risk uh, in those situations. Um, and it's less costly than the current, uh, for example, when uh, Council Member Rainville talked about uh, issues of uh, suicides in the river, often a state patrol helicopter is used in those instances. And so if we can use uh, remote reconnaissance in those instances, it's quicker, and it maybe can save uh, the victim sooner in those instances. But at the same time, uh, we need council to take concrete steps to protect our fundamental constitutional rights. Um, so to fill in the gaps in the state law, uh, of course, MPD had presented as part of their presentation that there is state statute over uh, remote reconnaissance UAVs, but that does not uh, go to all types of remote reconnaissance, including ground reconnaissance. Think of the uh, little ones with uh, wheels that can go inside a uh, place where there's a hostage situation or something like that. Those are also data privacy uh, concerns as well. Um, so uh, all Minneapolis agencies should have clear lines of authority and accountability for reconnaissance and data privacy. Um, council should work on data privacy practices as happened in the last couple of years with data privacy for, I'll call it written communication, but also things like as simple as when a, a traffic agent takes a picture of your car. So thank you. Thank you. Joe Tamburino is next, and then Amity Foster will be after Joe Tamburino. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Tamburino. I live and work in Ward 3. I'm an attorney in Minneapolis, and I'm here to speak in support of the UAV or the drone program for three reasons. First, it is completely legal. There's a state statute on it, 626.19, as well as constitutional. Um, if you go to even the ACLU's website, what it clearly says, it makes recommendation on the uses of UAV, and it says they should be used in emergency situations or when there are specific and articulable grounds to believe that drone will collect evidence relating to a specific criminal act. That's called reasonable suspicion. It's already in the statute. It clearly states that's when there's reasonable suspicion of a particular criminal activity, you can use a drone. It's constitutional because these drones are recording things in the public realm. You can ask your city attorney, as soon as everyone or one person in this building goes out on 4th Street, that's a public street. We could video each other. We could take pictures of each other. Our expectation of privacy is severely diminished when we're in the public realm, not like in your apartment or in your condo or in your home. But when you're on the street, you can be videoed. That's why in many magazines we see celebrities and stars being taken pictures of in videos as they're coming out of restaurants and clubs or getting into cars. It's 100% legal. Number two, it's good for public safety in two grounds. 
Sometimes police can't get to a situation in an emergency as fast as a drone can. July 4th, that evening was a very violent evening in Minneapolis. In my neighborhood, we basically had riots near the Stone Arch Bridge. There were shootings going on in Gold Medal Park on 2nd Street, and on my street, people were being shot at with commercial grade fireworks and at buildings. At the same time, there were seven people being shot at Boom Island Park. One woman was shot in the neck. So the police, who are already stretched thin, were concentrating on Boom Island, and we were hard to get to. Now, if there was a drone that would be able to do that, it could do surveillance, it could see what vehicles are being used, it could get license plates, and we could know what was happening. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Tamarino. Amity Foster is next, and then Colnice Hendon will be following Amity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Members. My name is Amity Foster, and I live in Ward 3 in the Sheridan neighborhood. Minneapolis Police Department is abusive and incompetent. The Minnesota Department of Human Rights found this to be true, and that's why the city is going through a consent decree process. I have serious concerns with giving an abusive police department more powerful tools to surveil our communities when, re when recent history shows that they regularly abuse the power that they already have. We do deserve to be safe from violence, violence in our communities, and violence at the hands of the police. The consent decree is part of reforming what is broken, and Mayor Fry should be focused on reforming Minneapolis Police Department through that process, not giving them more tools that they will abuse. The mayor has full control over MPD, and building out a drone program, instead of leading on the consent decree process with the state to make real changes, his priorities are not the community, they're the status quo, and they are quick fixes that won't do anything to reform a broken public safety system. Thank you. Thank you, and our next person is Colnice Hinda. Will you please state your name for the record? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and City Council members. I'm Colnice Hendon. I'm here representing BBCC. I'm a North Minneapolis resident of Ward 4. I am opposed to drones in my community. There are a lot of things flying through the air in my neighborhood. They include bullets. They include hovering helicopters. And I don't need the addition of drones as well. If I had any belief or trust that it would increase public safety, I would have a different opinion. But instead, I believe additional surveillance will lead to additional raids, the um, potential for arrest and more uh, mass incarceration of African American, Latino, Native American, other people of color. So for that, case, for that, for that purpose, I believe that Mayor Fry's uh, effort should be focused on it, trying to increase public trust that has been, ir I would not say irreparably damaged, but let's say it's been severely damaged by the incidents that began two years ago with the, the murder of George Floyd and continued to this day. I think that timing is everything. So with a, with a consent decree that puts some sort of checks and balances and some sort of monitoring of, of police accountability, once that public trust has been reestablished, then maybe, I don't know, some sort of monitored use of drones. I was in Brooklyn, New York a few years ago for an International African Art Fair. We were there simply to look at art, enjoy dance, eat good food, socialize. Drones were just floating all over the place and it gives you the impression, the feeling, and the knowledge that you're not trusted just simply because of the color of your skin. So I would just like to emphasize to Mayor, Fr Mayor Fry to focus your attention on the police consent decree. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean LaFontaine. Or, I'm sorry, or Jean. Jean. Thank you. Will you state your name for the record? Absolutely. Um, so my name is Jean LaFontaine. I'm a resident in Ward 10. Um, I am here to uh, echo the concerns made by Council Member Wansley. Um, I'm here to echo the concerns uh, made by Colnice. I too um, do not uh, feel that having drones in our neighborhoods um, is an effective use of our resources, nor do I think that it's um, effectively what the focus should be on. We've, as Council Member Wansley um, stated, 
Um, and as is clear and transparent evidence-based research that is available to members of the general public, it's crystal clear that MPD has already engaged in patterns and practices of racial discrimination, including surveillance against um, black leaders and black activists and people of color. There were two situations that happened in my neighborhood. Um, one situation was a domestic altercation that I was suddenly caught in the middle of. We did not feel safe to call MPD in that situation. Another situation was when someone opened up um, fire with an assault rifle at a neighborhood at a house right across the street from me. And I have a hard time seeing how drones would be helpful in either of those situations, um, unless they were imposing on our civil rights to just privately do what we want to do um, in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I do think that the focus should be um, primarily placed on the consent decree process. I think we should focus on ensuring that MPG stops lying and spying on residents. I think we should focus on ensuring that not only that occurs, but also that we invest in alternatives to public safety, um, such as uh, uh, behavioral crisis responders. The team that's been established is a good step in the right direction, and we need more of that. I also think we need clear-cut discipline um, for MPD and to stop coaching. Um, and I, finally, I have to say, I think we deserve to stop having incompetent policing because that murder case still has not been solved, and it is still terrifying. And we deserve to be safe from both the situations that are occurring, from the violence that is occurring in our communities, and from the violence that is occurring at the hands of the police department. Thank you all. Thank you. And our next speaker is Emmanuel, and the last name starts with the B. Thank you. Will you please state your name for the record? Um, hello, I'm Emmanuel Bio. Um, I use they, them, oh, they, he pronouns, um, and I live in Ward 4. Um, and I'm here today to testify against um, the use of drones in the police department. I think one of the things that we have seen is a lack of trust within community members and community citizens with the police, and the fact that that is not the focus, the focal point of what is what is needing to be done within the police department is kind of sad. Um, and so to see a, a to see record of a corrupt police department ask for more opportunities to be corrupt um, is terrifying as a resident of Minneapolis seeing how often that black and brown um, t teenagers and especially black and brown people in general are utilized as blood basically to spray across and I also want to kind of provide um, clarity on where these drones might be utilized as someone who lives in Ward 4 um, I can see these being kind of vacant, I mean, see these being used um, very often within the ward, seeing the, the ideas of crime within Ward 4. Um, and also, I think we should take in consideration that police has a very high record of spying and lying um, against citizens of Minneapolis. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Van Pelt. Thank you, and will you please state your name for the record? I'm Susan Van Pelt. I live in Ward 3 in the Mill District, and I also experienced the disturbances there on the night of July 4th. I gather that the, proposed, the proposal for use of UAVs by the police department is already pretty much a done deal, but I still wanted to share my concerns, the reasons for my concerns, and a thought about future policy regarding UAVs in Minneapolis policing. I don't need to explain why and how public trust in MPD has deteriorated in recent years, especially since May 25th, 2020. Right now, in my view, the last thing we need is to exacerbate the already strained relations between MPD and the citizens of Minneapolis by introducing technology that carries vast potential for abuse with little to no real meaningful public input or oversight. To me, this move heightens the sense of antagonism between police and the public and further undermines public trust in the police and the city government. I've looked at the draft policy. On the face of it, it sounds reasonable with safeguards built in, but do we trust MPD to abide by that? No. We I, at least, and many others do not. I'm not worried about UAV's technology itself, but it is powerful and relatively new, and I am concerned about MPD's ability to use it appropriately 
without infringing on the rights of Minneapolis citizens. If and when MPD does start using UAVs, civilian oversight must be built in from the start and ongoing with a real part in decision making and in determining consequences for any abuse. Please know that Minneapolis residents of Ward 3 are informed, paying attention, and voting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Brown. Will you please state your name for the record? My name is Cynthia Brown. I live in North Minneapolis. I'm in Ward 4. And the reason I'm here is because I don't feel like we should have any drones. The police department is, Minneapolis Police Department is broken. And it has been broken for decades. Um, the racial discrimination that I have personally um, come across in, in living here for 36 years. Um, I, like I say, I live in North Minneapolis. We have a, a problem calling the police. We are fearful of the police. They do not protect and they definitely do not serve. And instead of taking drones, they need to um, have places where young people can wake up in the morning and have some place to go, something to do besides stand on the corner and get in trouble, be um, approached by Minneapolis police, um, and also taking, doing things um, to, to harm them. I, I, I'm very concerned with young people and where they should can go to um, do art, uh, learn how to cook, learn to do things besides stand on the corner and be approached by uh, the broken police department. Um, I am very against having drones in my neighborhood. Like I said, we are fearful of the police and so that's why I feel like we, we shouldn't have uh, added uh, tools for them to use against us. So again, I'd like to thank you. Um, have a good day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul, and last name starts with an A. Thank you. Will you please state your name for the record? Hi, I'm Paul Andrighetti. Um, yeah, I echo. But just about everybody has said I'm vastly against this. Um, I think the police department has repeatedly shown that it cannot regulate itself and it's only ever being regulated by itself. And quite plainly, they abuse just about every form of technology they have and the unions protect them repeatedly and the mayor continues to pump more money into them. Now, if this was a discussion about giving $40,000 to the fire department, to fly drones to help save people's lives like they're stating it would be in an instant. Take it from the police department, give it to the fire department because they actually serve and protect people. They don't terrorize them. This is clearly just going to lead towards the state becoming more oppressive towards its citizens using the police as that mechanism. If the police were serious about this proposal and cared anything about what we were going to say, they would have come with detailed plans on discipline. They would have told us how this oversight committee, a public oversight committee, was composed of the places that are most often detrimentally affected by police brutality. They would have come with all of that prepared, but instead they've come with none of that prepared and wanting us to speak on a half-baked policy. This is not good governance. This is not good checks and balances, and it should not go forward and people don't want this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Munira Mohammed. Will you please state your name for the record? Thank you. 
Yes, thank you. My name is Manira Mohammed. Uh, I am in War 10, and I'm here on behalf of Safety Not Surveillance. Um, so I want to begin by saying we've been organizing for this whole month, the moment that we heard that MPD had a proposal on drones out, and we've gotten a petition together with 181 signatures that we've sent to all council members and the mayor, as well as Dr. Alexander. Um, and then I think I just want to comment on how this has been done. Um, you know, that proposal, I think, is entirely inadequate. The only thing that is bringing MPD to the public right now, the only reason they have a proposal is because of an ACLU state law making them uh, disclose this, making them do a public comment section. But what we've seen across the state is that nothing happens with that public comment. They essentially carry on using drones as they like. Um, and I think uh, the officer that was up here gave the impression that uh, ACLU commented on that proposal. We did not. SNS kind of organized and got the attention of council members and got the attention of the mayor and then gave our input. We were not, um, you know, we did, they did not come to us for any kind of input at all. Um, I also just want to say that if there are legitimate good use cases for drones. We have not been proven that. We have not been proven what crimes they'll be used for and that this whole process is essentially backwards. It should not be up to us, the community, to prove that these will be used in a bad way when we have an open investigation in MPD, uh, when we have the report from the human rights detailing surveillance of black leaders. Um, I think you have to ignore so much reality just to get to this moment to say that it's all right for MPD to have drones or that this process is democratic when it's anything but. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Whelan. Will you please state your name for the record? Hi, uh, my name is Chris Whelan. I am a penetration tester and the chair of Restore the Fourth Minnesota. We're also sort of we're also part of the Safety Not Surveillance Coalition. While I don't live in Minneapolis, many of the members of Restore the Fourth Minnesota do, and they share my general concerns, both with the policy and with the general proposition about MPD acquiring and using drones. Um, we've had productive conversations with a lot of you and with the mayor about our about our concerns with the policy and. We hope to continue those conversations and we hope to talk about ways that we can make the policy better. Uh, but to quickly summarize, you, you really need to tighten the, you really need to tighten the, uh, those warrant exceptions. I was glad to hear that they don't plan on using them for surveillance, but in the policy as, at least in the draft policy as written, there's nothing that would prevent them from deploying drones over a park if there was a reasonable suspicion that someone was breaking a quality of life crime, as was done in Golden Valley to fly drones over uh, a, a beach that was popularly used for people sunbathing naked. Do we really want to deploy drones in those and use them in that way? I, I don't think so. Um, the lieutenant mentioned that the primary use case would be for emergency situations, um, but throughout the state what we've seen is that the most common use of these drones have actually been for public relations and for training purposes. Um, so I guess one of the questions is, do we want data collected through most of those use cases to be used for the prosecution of crimes? I don't think we do. The scope of the data that's collected should be limited to the use of the initial deployment. There's a whole host of other concerns that we have with the policy, and like I said, we're looking forward to working with you on them, but zooming out more broadly, I want to say that these drones are, this technology is incredibly powerful, and that they're not a panacea for a lack of personnel. A drone can't replace a person, they can't take witness testimony, they can't cuff a suspect. Um, at least not not yet. And the reason why I consider drone technology such a potential danger is because it can be used as a platform for delivering other surveillance technology. And there's a really strong need for a much more comprehensive approach to the oversight and regulation of surveillance technology because drones can be used to deploy that other surveillance technology. We need a much more comprehensive way to deal with this stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Latrell Snyder. Thank you. Will you say, state your name for the record, please? My name is Latrell Snyder. I live in Ward 4, and um, I'm horribly at public speaking, so let's hope I can convey why I am against drones. So for one, before it is normal to see drones in the sky, I want it to be normal to see a police department that we can trust and call on. Uh, before it's normal to see drones in the sky, I want to see, I don't want to see any police involve murders. I want to be able to call the police and know that I'm getting a trained professional that's going to follow protocols. 
Uh, I want to see police using de-escalation tactics when they need to. Um, also, I want to see full transparency with the police department, which means uh, the consent decree, because without that, um, how can we trust a police department that's already been proven where they, we can't trust them? So the Minneapolis police report came out with all the stuff. We already been over this a million times. They had Facebook spying, uh, lying, taking stuff from uh, people that they're arresting or whatever. So we cannot trust the police department. Minneapolis police department has been that way for a very long time. So unless they can prove to us, they have a lot of proof proven to do to us that we can trust them. So with the consent decree, that would allow, that would probably put us a little bit more at ease because that in is in it to, for it to be uh, proven to work, the consent decree would probably put us at ease knowing that we can have a police department that we can trust and uh, count on. So. Um, what else did I have here? That's pretty much it. Um, oh, I also want to comment on, he said there was no timeline for the consent decree, but there was a one to two month timeline for f drones, which I think is kind of like backwards. So I think that they should pretty much get that in order too. So thank you guys for your time and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Steve Kramer. Will you please state your name for the record? Sure will. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm Steve Kramer. I'm the President and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council, also a resident of Ward 11. I am certain you are hearing regularly from your constituents about the reality of their public safety concerns and experiences. I can tell you it's a daily, if not hourly, occurrence for our organization interacting with companies large and small and with people who work, live, and visit downtown. There is both the reality of these daily, hourly concerns and the perception of safety in Minneapolis. Responding to both requires building greater confidence about a safe future for our city and our downtown. To make progress, we need to use every permissible tool available, including technology. This is true in the best of times, and it's even more true when we face unprecedented challenges with diminished capacity to respond. That's what brings me here today to support MPD's proposed use of drone technology consistent with Minnesota statute. There's a reason some 80 agencies, including law enforcement, have begun to use tech drone technology. Uses like those outlined by uh, Commander Kingsbury, crit critical incident and disaster response, tactical operations, crime and crash scene documentation, and on. These uses enhance and amplify safety efforts. Looking forward, they are more necessary than ever. Now, they're more necessary now than ever. And Madam Chair, here's my last point. Congenital distrust, congenital distrust of MPD for some will never be overcome. It cannot be a reason to deny use of tools that will address the number one issue facing our city, making Minneapolis safer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lucy Holland. Will you please step forward and state your name for the record? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Lucy Holland. Uh, I have lived in Ward 10 for years and I work in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, I am here today to speak out against the unwarranted invasion of resident privacy via MPD surveillance drones. Um, I did see the line in the presentation about this is not a surveillance program. Surveillance is defined as close observation, especially as, uh, excuse me, especially of spies or criminals. I'm not sure what definition of surveillance MPD is operating from here. This hearing does little else than present a facade of accountability. MPD representatives, also in attendance today, have already repeatedly failed to clarify basic logistical personnel questions from Council Member Wansley herself in a prior session. If MPD is not accountable to City Council and enjoys broad leeway under Mayor Fry's leadership, what impact can citizens hope to have? Surveillance does not create safety. MPD has an already extensively documented practice of wrongfully monitoring activists and protesters. This surveillance would expansively increase MPD's capacity to maintain their predatory practices. Business interests may lament empirically questionable crime rates and decrying the horrors of spray paint, but ultimately the council's responsibility is to that of the city and its residents. Minimally regulated surveillance burdens this entire populace, chilling citizen engagement and dissent for the purported benefit of catching a few alleged shoplifters or car thieves. The exceptions to this proposal swallow the rule. It does not matter if you have extensive exceptions when MPD can contort around them to access drones at their slightest whim. In closing, I reiterate, surveillance does not create safety. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donald Bystrom. Hello, my name is Donald Bystrom. I am gonna build upon 
the idea that surveillance doesn't create safety, and another idea proposed earlier that um, the public may not trust Minneapolis Police Department, but we would be totally fine if Minneapolis Fire Department had drones. Um, and that sounds like a silly idea, but I, I will get into it. Um, so the proposed drone program is for ongoing response and surveillance. It will take time from when a situation starts to when you can actually have the drone up and running and starting to surveil. There will have had to be a police officer on the scene already. So these you know, the situations are going to be the long, big uh, situations and unsafe it, um, things that they want to use the drones for. Things that like the Minneapolis State Patrol currently uses the helicopter for. It would not be for responding to a 911 call before an officer arrives because you would need that trained uh, a visual observer to watch the drone physically and if they're that close, they might as well respond to it themselves. Um, so I would say that yeah, you should consider the use case of either when, if Minneapolis Police Department continues to use drones, maybe adding this to your policy, or if the council does decide to somehow limit the use of drones by Minneapolis Police Department, maybe adding the use of drones by the Minneapolis Department of 911 for emergency response. As a uh, resident of Minneapolis, I might feel com more comfortable calling 911 if I know a drone will show up in two minutes and the person I'm talking to is the, just using that drone to watch the situation as the operator of 911. I can trust them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Jones. Will you please state your name for the record? Good afternoon, my name is Kimberly Jones. I'm a leader with BBCC and I live in Ward 5. I'm here today to testify against giving drones to the MPD. As we all know, the MPD has been fund found by the Minnesota Department of Human Rights to be engaged in discrimination, abuse, and surveillance of our communities. The mayor of our city has full control over the MPD. Instead of giving the police more tools to abuse and surveil our community, the mayor should be leading through the consent decree process with the state of Minnesota to make real changes to the MPD. So I question why and how the city has the resources to buy drones in an effort to cut down on crime, yet fail to reallocate even a portion of those funds into community programs to engage our youth, many of whom find themselves limited opportunities economically, educationally, and socially. And while I do understand that having an eye in the sky can provide the police with locating suspects, the collection of evidence, and provide 3D images within minutes, and we know that all of these actions can be completed within a fraction of time, that it would take ground to a ground unit to conduct an investigation. And given the current low clearance rate of the MPD, that might be helpful. However, I question what else is at stake for a community that does not trust the Minneapolis Police Department. I and my neighbor's right to privacy, that's at stake. Policing without a system of community partnership, that is at stake. A violation of trust, that is also at stake. Perhaps the less than 40% case closure rate is the rationalization for drones, but when the police department is both abusive and incompetent, surveillance drones cannot fix that pervasive issue. I believe that the people of Minneapolis deserve to be safe from violence, in our communities, as well as violence at the hands of the police. That is not an issue that drones can solve. Only transparency and partnership can do that. Mayor Frey should be focused on reforming MPD through a strong consent decree instead of giving MPD more tools to surveil and abuse our communities. And the only path to a functional safety system is to reform what is and has been for a long time broken within the MPD through the consent decree process. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Philip Demery. Will you please state your name for the record? My name is Philip Demery. I'm, I'm uh, mentally challenged somewhat, but uh, my position is from a conscientious observer. Uh, my understanding of uh, uh, the idea of the drone that seems to be a violation and will be a violation of civil liberties. Um, I listened to the other gentleman talk. Uh, you have an ingrown culture here of, uh, of uh, 
the abuse, and, and, and which was clearly indicated in the report done by the Department of Human Rights, and, and certainly, and, and unless you admit that 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 that's there uh, by addressing a situation such as, for the instance, uh, the death of Melvin Carter, who died while in the custody of the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, his there seems to be a tacit approval uh, based upon the inactions to admit, address, and and, and exercise the legal rights, the constitutional rights of, of the individuals here. And here you're going to give uh, individuals the ability to accumulate that information. Well, uh, we've seen this guy go to this house. He came into that house. Uh, you've got this ingrown culture to uh, the ideal of Senator Humphrey, uh, the late Senator Humphrey, uh, his attempt to uh, create the same sort of of, of just a system as Mayor Fry was derailed because of that ingrown culture. And if you read the let, open letter to the to the um, uh, to the city council, uh, it, it details that and some of the other information that's been provided to each and every lawmaker uh, that's here to whom was given uh, a tacit approval. If there's not an inaction, not only to address the Carter situation, Carver situation, but to address the other situations that were issued in the in the documentation that was supplied to each and every one of you lawmakers. Um, so I, I think it's a great idea on one hand, if you address uh, the possible chances of the uh, paying out of the nose, uh, on the other hand, uh, tacit uh, inaction, or as they call it, um, a pre-action or reaction, you will find yourself in a reactionary position if you don't address the issues in which I just discussed. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Aaron McCain. Hi, my name is Dr. Aaron McCain, and I'm here speaking in two capacities, first as a citizen and second as the executive director of the Institute for Digital Humanity, which is maybe the nation's premier bipartisan digital ethics think tank, which brings together conservatives and liberals, Republicans, Democrats, Christians, and Muslims, people of all over the world, together to actually get together and fight not against each other, but with each other for our digital rights, which is the number one civil rights issue in the world right now. I'm also here in my capacity as a Minneapolis citizen and a former resident of uh, Ms. Vita's ward uh, until a bullet came flying through my window last Halloween, missing my head by four feet, but hitting the part of my brain where my PTSD lives and basically shattering my life. So on, as somebody with family members who are police and who is a victim of crime, I am very sympathetic to our police trying to do the best they can in a city that is a bit on fire. But here is the thing. There is no challenge in this century that this country is facing that is greater than the threat of our civil rights being eroded by this technology. It is unfortunate that my conservative friends are good on privacy but often can't connect the dots, and it's unfortunate that my liberal friends are good on racial equity and discrimination but don't understand how any gathering of data that can be correlated to protected statuses such as race, class, gender, religion, who you vote for, who you associate with, what church you go to, what race you are, doesn't accidentally become discrimination, it by programmed default will become discrimination. The data to discrimination pipeline must be fought at every instance. This is our moment to stand up as a city. We already did the right thing passing the statewide ban on warrantless surveillance. We already did the right thing banning racist uh, facial recognition technology. Don't betray the work this city is doing ahead of the consent decree and with the world watching by rolling back our civil rights in this complete completely, frankly, uneducated process because I'm a nerd with a coalition, an international coalition of nerds who gets paid to study this stuff. Y'all don't. Don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Janello. Uh, Sanello. Sorry. Yeah. Will you please state your name for the record? Yeah. Alex Sanello. I'm a neighbor of the 10th Ward. Go, go ahead. Oh, uh, so I have four points to make. The first is that there's no such thing as police accountability. They fight tooth and nail to keep murderers on the payroll. They will not meaningfully discipline people for the use of drones. The second, we need to recognize just how powerful these tools are. Uh, through a combination of powerful lenses and stabilizing technologies, these things can just go out on the street and look directly into your house and see your entire house. 
The doctrine of plain view means absolutely nothing if we allow this. There's no need for a search warrant. They can just go outside and look and see everything that is in your house. That is very, very scary. Uh, as a third point, we have the largest prison population in the entire world. If more surveillance was going to fix the problem, the problem would be fixed already. We do not need to keep expanding the police state. And number one, it is a neat idea for things like people falling in the river and emergency disasters. But you know what? The fire department can do that. And you know what? The fact that the police have eroded public trust so far that we are not allowing them to have this so they can save lives in real emergencies is very, very sad. And I think we should recognize that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lucia Bennett. Will you please state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is Lucia Bennett. Um, and I want to echo the points of I think most people here um, that are not OK with this drone program. Um, I feel a little bit like we're all just talking at a wall because it's very clear that the police are just going to go ahead and do what they want with this program. I think there are claims that uh, there's not going to be surveillance and that there will be transparency with this program are pretty laughable in light of their behavior over the last few decades in the entire history of this city. Um, and I also basically just want to say that the reason that, there are, that there's a community trust issue is because the police keep murdering and incarcerating people who shouldn't be murdered or incarcerated. It's not because the community just can't come to some like solution of trust. So the reality is, is that the police have more surveillance technology than they ever had in history. There's no reason we need to give them more um, when this police department specifically has a global and national reputation for their brutality um, and for lying. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is David, and the last name begins with an F. Thank you. Will you state your name for the record? <clears throat> David Frankel. Uh, I do consulting work with commercial UAS or drones, very familiar with the space, and I also volunteer with the largest uh, commercial trade organization, uh, called AUVSI. Uh, they put on all kinds of seminars and conferences on drones that are very useful, but the Minneapolis Police Department is probably well aware there is a trade organization that's free for anybody to join called DroneResponders.org, and they put on free webinars, and it's law enforcement who have a lot of good use cases of the use of drones. Also, I'd like to say that nationwide, the use of of drones by all law enforcement and by fire departments is growing rapidly. And if anybody violates the use of drones, it's not just local law enforcement that has to do something. Pilots can use, lose their FAA Part 107 license. So there is a higher being that regulates the use of drones, not just a local entity or a state entity. Uh, there are several larger organizations like the State Patrol that use drones primarily for accident reconstruction. The Hennepin County Sheriff across the street has had a drone program for several years, and there's never been any issue with that. Their program was started by some Delta airline pilots who work as reserves in their drone program. The one thing you may not be aware of is the United States Customs and Border Patrol has a drone, a very big drone up in North Dakota that has come and flown over Minneapolis several times. It, various times. That is not covered by any uh, laws in Minnesota. That is a federal agency. They have and they can, at the request of law enforcement, do search and rescue for the city of Minneapolis on request. It came down here during the George Floyd uh, riots. I'm not clear who requested them to come. The one thing, the last thing I'd like to ask is that the Department of Defense has a program called Blue UAS, which is a program to buy drones made in the United States. The majority of drones purchased even by law enforcement are made in China. And right now you may be aware there's a conflict in Ukraine and both sides are using Chinese drones. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don McMillan. Will you please state your name for the record? Don McMillan, I am a resident of Ward 1. Uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Payne, you're my representative. 
I hear a lot of crap coming down this room today. I hear a lot of stuff people don't really understand. I was a military police dog handler for 17 years. Bomb dogs, narcotics dogs, patrol dogs. I wish we would have had drones. If you've never been at the receiving end of somebody that's armed, and as a military policeman, hold on, as a military policeman, me, Don. Do it, face me. I represented people from all walks of life, all nationalities, everywhere. We need the drones. We need that extra tool in the toolbox. Now, if you're having a problem with the police department, and a lot of you are, you should maybe reach out and speak to the police department instead of hiding in your houses, not wanting to call 911. I'm Don, old. Don. I'm 68 years old. Thank you. Please keep it respectful. Yes, I'm and, and, I, and I will talk be. Talk to me. Don't do it. I'm 68 years old and Order. I was born in this city. I'm a little disgusted with the fact that maybe mom and dad haven't been calling the kids in at night and take care of business in some cases. No. Don, I'm going to end your. Are you going to cut I'm me going to cut you off. You okay. have to direct. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bobby Hole. Thank you. Will you please state your name for the record? My name is Bobby Hall. I live in 8th Ward. I live next door to the uh, flood pond that has Say Their Name Cemetery on it. And you know, there was drones flying over my house during this whole time. I've been in this house since 1968. And I've never seen so much racial discrimination coming from our Minneapolis Police Department. You know, our last chief of police sued Minneapolis uh, Police Department for racial discrimination. And he didn't trust the police department any more than the rest of us did. You know, out of 8,000, 82,973 black people in Minneapolis, only 20,874 of them are registered voters. And out of that 28, 874, only 3,469 black people vote. Why is that? They don't trust the system. Okay, we don't get no justice down here. You know, you were supposed to do something with our police department. And what do you want to do? You want to arm them up more. You want to militarize them more. Why don't we sensitize them? Why don't we humanize them? Why don't we spend the time making mankind kind again? Okay? Why don't we take in consideration that I got a heart and a soul just like the rest of us? And the police department need to realize that they're not the monsters. We need to make them human again. Okay? We don't need to uh, build up their military forces any longer. We need to bring them into our community. They don't need drones. They don't need these squad cars. They need to walk the beat and get down here with the people. They don't want to be a part of the community. Make them work with the community if they don't want to live with the community. Okay? Let's spend the money on teen centers. Let's do something with our youth. Thank you. Our next speaker is Keith McCarran. Will you please state your name for the record? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Keith McCarran. I live in Ward 3. Thank you for allowing me the chance to speak. Um, I... Personally, I'm aghast and disgusted by the fact that we're even discussing this prior to we haven't even reached a criminal conclusion on the murder and lynching of George Floyd. Uh, we haven't even really dealt with the murder of Amir Locke. We haven't dealt with the murder of Laniel Frazier. We haven't dealt with the murder of Andrew Tekle Sunberg, but yet... Instead, we're going to talk about more ways to oppress people. And I'm going to call a rose a rose. The idea that this isn't surveillance is ridiculous and ludicrous. It's an eye in the sky. Every single night, I have to listen to State Patrol helicopter fly over my house all night long. The Cirrus SR-22 spy plane flying over all the time. And the idea that this is going to be proposed, I didn't hear one example, one concrete example 
of crimes being solved, people being found, none of this. But, but we got 60 agencies using this technology, but no examples of how lives have been saved. And the idea that the fire department can't launch the boat before a, a, a drone gets there is a smack in the face to the fire department. I suggest you take that up with them because I think they have something else to say about that. So, I mean, if we can't even get the truth in this hearing about what this program is, there's no discipline matrix. We're gonna go out there with a big hammer and then come up with solutions after the fact. We see how well that's worked. And we haven't even gotten to this consent decree yet. So, and thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is, I think it's Mohammed, and the last name starts with the S. This one is really hard to see. Sorry. Is it Maharad? It might be me. Okay. I hope, I hope it's not Will you anyone. please state your name for the record? It's Maharad Sayrafi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I live in Ward 7, and I'm here to oppose uh, this um, proposal, which, as others said, said, probably is going to go through anyway, but hopefully you can exert some control over it. In particular, we heard a lot from uh, Commander King Kingsley about um, oversight and accountability, but um, I think even in that presentation, there were inaccuracies that uh, should be addressed. For instance, he mentioned that in 2020, there were no drone flights for surveillance, but as uh, someone else earlier mentioned, uh, there, in fact, was a CPD MQ-9 Reaper drone that flew over Minneapolis on May 29, 2020. This was only reported not by the organization in the city that requested it, but by news, news organizations, CNN and, and Forbes and others. And we still don't know what organization request, requested it. So if we can't have accountability about something that happened in May of 2020, how are we supposed to have accountability now. In addition, um, there is no clear uh, way to identify a drone. Let's say if I, if I see a drone in my street or, or my backyard, am I going to recognize that this is the police drone or my neighbor's drone that's trying to like, look through my window? What happens when situations like that happen? There's no information about the cost, specific models. There's no information about releasing the footage if a drone catches uh, a police officer in committing a crime. Is that footage going to be kept or is that going to be deleted? Um, there's not enough information about who can change these policies that uh, seem to be proposed. Um, and in the end, I think you are the only one who have some amount of control over this. So I ask you to uh, exert your power. Thank you. Thank you. Our, the next speaker just initialed. I don't know if the person is here. It looks like an R. If not, I'll just move on to the... Okay, Rich. You didn't spell that out for me. Yeah, you Please know, I state like your name for the record. On the public record. Thank you. Madam Chair, for the record, my name is Rich Neumeister. I'm from east of the river, the city of St. Paul. I'm an open government and privacy advocate. Been around for a number of years. I'm sometimes known as a commodity with some people on this particular issue. So let's go to it, to the policy. It is an apt, inept policy. It needs to be strengthened. Let's take a look on A2 of page two of the policy. Constitutional and privacy rights will be protected, but do, we, do you as policymakers know what they are? Secondly, in that regards, it's important to note that the exclusions on page three of the policy, which mirror state law, strip away a lot of the Fourth Amendment protections and also 1980 case law that deals with technology. From my own experience at the legislature, I've dealt with those kinds of issues all the time where we find out technology, the case, the law has not caught up with the technology. It's where you as policymakers can have some good policy on those kinds of things, and the legislature allows you to do that. Let's take a look at page three. Okay, there are two points. You take a look under those uh, exceptions over a public event where there is heightened risk to the safety of participants or bystanders. That's a big hole. Oh, there's not gonna be 24 hour surveillance. Oh, but you might have five hour surveillance. You might have a drone that might have an hour battery to it. It can still do surveillance kinds of things. Let's take a look at another one to collect information from a public area where there's a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity that 
has been with some folks across the country or whatever used as individual suspicion. So you can have individual. Another one is I on page three, where a government agency that uh, and doesn't have the protections of the current law, which only deals with law enforcement, can use it. Let's, let's look over zoning. Let's assess it, use it in assessing. That's where some policy things can be done. Let's continue on. Let's take a look on page five. F, use of vision enhancement technology, which is not gen generally not available to the public. Well, that needs to be fleshed out. You can have technology that can also you be used as microphones. And the last point, if you take a look on all those protocols, requests for deployment, shall develop, shall develop, shall develop. Before this policy is developed and put on the books, you need to know, and the public needs to know, what are those? Those protocols are important. Thank you, So, Madam Mitch. Chair, members of the committee, I thank you very much for the few moments. Take ownership of the policy. Thank you, Rich. It's the only way it can be our next done speaker, for the president. Our next speaker is Julia Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Will you state your name for the record, please? Good afternoon. My name is Julia Johnson. I live near 38th in Chicago, also known as George Floyd Square. Um, and as locals say, that's the most heavily surveilled neighborhood in the country right now. And I live that every day. I'm opposed to MPD's purchase of UAVs. They will not increase safety. I've witnessed firsthand the human rights violations of the Minneapolis Police Department, and with they've had no remorse, let alone accountability, for any of the many violations that they continue to do. MPD has a clear pattern of over-policing, harassing black and brown people and poor people. Their racism and abuse was laid clear not only with the recent Minnesota Human Rights Report, but also in the MPD 150 report years ago. This uh, violation of state, local, and federal laws is why we should not be granting them more powerful weapons and tools to, um, we should not be giving that to a corrupt and violent police force. No money to MPD. We need to be giving money into real public safety right now that actually prevents harm. The only tool that we should be giving MPD right now is the consent decree. Give that tool to them right now so that they can actually sift through the corruption, have accountability, and have these policies written out that we can hold them accountable to. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike David. Yep. Will you please state your name for the record? Mike David, I'm a Minnesota resident. And um, I just like to just say about, uh, you know, people who like to think they're trustworthy, you know. And, you know, when you give people privileges, it seems like they just, you know, could easily not do the right thing. And uh, I just think it's uh, a violation of our civil rights and I don't think we should have them. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marika, and the last name starts with a P. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Please state your name for the record. Marika Pfefferkorn. Uh, good afternoon. This afternoon? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council. I come before you today as a representative and member of the Safety Not Surveillance Coalition. I am the co-founder of the Twin Cities Innovation Alliance. We have an office in North Minneapolis and Northeast where we serve community members, business, and others. And today I think we've already kind of gone over all the technical things. I'm really compelled with the argument about opposing this. But I also want to encourage you, if you are not in that place where you can oppose it, let us delay and do our due diligence. I believe that there are more questions at hand than we actually have answers for, and that became more clear today in the presentation earlier from the Minneapolis Police Department. I'd like to say I have questions about what is the full cost of this investment? What is the actual investment and what is the transparency that is required for us to understand what the budget actually will be required to pursue this? 
What is the human impact? What is the financial impact? And what is the trust impact? The human impact has been demonstrated by lived experience and research that black and brown communities are impacted more greatly than others. The human impact is that lives are changed when surveillance happens and there's mistakes that are made. The financial impact, if we are looking at this in a comprehensive manner, we don't just look at the price of the drone. We look at the price of the training and the development. We look at the price of what it costs after we have harmed community members and they deserve financial recompense because they have been hit hard by it. And then what is the trust impact that we have? Because our community members already know that Minneapolis Police Department has not held up their end of the bargain. Tools are only as good as the human beings driving the tools behind them. And right now, we do not have the comp competency with this tool to proceed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tammy, and the last name begins with an S. Is no, I'm sorry. It's skin away. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Will you state it for the record, please? Hello, my name is Tammy Skinaway. Thank you for letting me speak. I am a resident of Minnesota, born and raised. I have connections with all sides of the city, different communities for many years. I am the former assistant of Mr. Clyde Belcourt, rest in peace, elder. Um, I have so many things to say. It doesn't, you know, two minutes, I don't know how I can do that. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and let everybody know that we are on Dakota and Ojibwe lands. And if we could try to remember and imagine how it was in this picture right here, before all of these buildings were here, before these councils were here, when my grandfathers, both of them, did government to government relations. I would like us all to probably look in the mirror and, and see who we are as humans, you know, as, as souls. Um, I was a teenage mother. I'm 51 years old now, almost. Um, and my three children are now grown, productive citizens, very loving human beings. But living in a poverty-stricken area, it's very hard for a person to, like me to approach Officers, but I've done that over the last 15 years, and I have to hurry up now. But I will let you know, uh, before George Floyd's murder, rest in peace, uh, in a Metro Urban Indian Directors meeting, I asked those uh, directors there that do not represent me, for the record, and do not represent many of our people in our community, that group, so please, please hear us. In that meeting, I asked that group and MPD if they were aware of any community policing in other parts of the world. They said no. I said, are you willing to look into that? And they haven't, and then look at where we are now. Minneapolis, we have dropped the ball. I'm able to speak to officers. I speak to officers, I speak to the fire department, I speak to everybody to let us know we're humans. We are humans, we have to remember that. So is this all right here for a stamp of approval? Or do you hear us? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patience Zalonga. Will you please state your name for the record? Greetings, council members. My name is Patience, and I am a Minneapolis resident. Two years ago, the Minneapolis Police Department relentlessly tear gas protesters shot people's eyes out and brutalized people to no end. Two years later, and we have not seen any footage from that time apart from the videos released as a result of Jaleel Stalling's trial. Thousands of hours of body cam footage have been tucked away from the public. If there's any inference I can make on what that footage may be on those cameras, it's sheer unruly violence of this police department of death. That footage makes Mayor Fry nervous, and yet we're being told to trust the police department's transparency on the usage of drones. How comical and laughable. The same police department that made fake social media profiles to illegally surveil black activists, organizers, and community members for absolutely no purpose at all. The same department that destroyed documents in the second precinct out of the baseless fear that protesters would discover sensitive files 
that would expose the insidious and most likely illegal practices of the Minneapolis police? Let's be honest here. No police department destroys documents unless it incriminates themselves. I have zero expectation that the Minneapolis police will be transparent or follow any guidelines for their usage of drones. This is about the police department's desire to surveil and harass individuals. This is about white people's paranoia of anyone who looks nothing like them. I am insulted by the proposition that we should simply trust this police department that has displayed to us time and time again that they answer to no one, they are accountable to no one. The idea that a drone would create better safety conditions for officers is purely outrageous when MPD is likely to make late night news for murdering someone. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Nolo Late. I think I'm so sorry. Will you please come forward and state your name for the record? Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Indolo Elate, uh, and I'm a resident of Ward Nine. I'm here to speak on the record that this uh, proposed or whatever already going through drone proposal is an expansion of an already wildly invasive surveillance state. This type of military technology is the same technology that the American Empire uses to control and dominate in its imperial colonies. We must resist the use of this t technology here as well as abroad. The truth is that the use of drones by MPD is yet another act of class war. This technology will be used to surveil and incriminate working class people, especially colonized and racialized people, to enforce the rule of the ruling class. This, it is not a question of if, but when. Minnesota has invested over a million dollars on UAV technology the past two years. Why doesn't the city of Minneapolis invest in addressing the actual root causes of violence? Why don't we put money into housing people? Why don't we put money into feeding people? Why don't we put money into making sure that everyone can afford the medication and the health care that they need? Why don't we put money into adequately addressing the multiple pandemics that we have going on? These are rhetorical questions because the state does not serve the people, as it has shown us time and time again. It serves the corporations and the ruling class. Power to the people, no matter the weapons the state attempts to form against us, we will resist. Thank you. Um, seeing no one else wishing to speak on this item, I will now close the public hearing. I'd like to thank those of you who came out today to speak. There is no further action required on this item. And seeing no business before us, I will declare this meeting. Well, I'm going to say something, even though I raised it, I guess um, our chair.